It's good to have uh, Anthony and Ray back and a special guest. Well, good morning. Stand with me as we open opening prayer. Praise the Lord. How many believe this is a good Sunday? Amen. If you come, if you come open and expecting, you are going to receive. Amen. It's like if, if you stick your cup of underneath the coffee maker upside down, you've got a mess. But you stick it right side up, opening up. And so open your heart up to Jesus this morning. Whether you're here or watching us online, uh, we are one body. Amen? We're one church. So Father, this morning we give you praise and we give you honor and glory for all that we do. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord together, Father. This is a good day. This is the day that you have made. There's no other day like this day. And so I, we pray, Father, that you would pour out your spirit upon us this morning. We are, we are vessels ready to receive. We give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. We pray for our country. On the brink of uh, uh, very disastrous changes, we know that you are still on the throne. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It matters who's seated in the heavenlies. We are that, Father, seated in the heavenlies with you. And so this morning we do pray, Lord, for the church in America. We pray for our country. We pray for the COVID uh, pandemic, Father, all those that have lost loved ones. Father, we pray that you would cover our nation and bring us back out of this darkness, Father, in Jesus' name.
So I don't know what you've come into this house with, but just know that he's great and greatly to be praised. His name is to be praised every single day of our lives for all the things that he has done and for who he is and for who we are in him. So this morning, just lift your hands and just give him all the praise that he alone deserves for bringing us this far from the beginning of this year to the very, this very moment.
Jewish language. There are several words that are the word phrase. One of them is, is a word called Tehillah. It's where we get the hallelujah from. Tehillah is, and I'm not even sure if that's the accurate pronunciation, but you know, we're, we're Americans, right? <laughs> Tehillah is that praise that comes out your spirit it's a it's a it's a card with no nothing written inside you know what i'm saying when you buy birthday cards or something like that there's cards that are blank on the inside i don't escapes you. Nothing takes you by surprise. You are not surprised by any event that takes place on planet Earth. Lord, you are the Lord and the God of the heavens. The entire world, the entire Earth is yours. So, Lord, as we, the church, your people, have gone through this year, show us eternity what's written on our tombstone is very important it's the born I was born in 1947 don't gasp 1947 then there's a dash then whatever date there is there that dash is an important part of my life what did I do for the kingdom what did I do what did I accomplish what did I leave what kind of a footprint who was affected by, by my life uh, uh, that's 
more important than anything you'll ever do is to prepare for the future in heaven. That preparation isn't in heaven. The preparation is right now. It's that dash. Very important. Amen. Very important. I hope your Christmas was good. A little different. Jane and I were going to spend our Christmas in St. Augustine with uh, our grandkids, but us a spirit of revelation, Father, in our hearts, that, that we might understand what your purposes are and what your calling is on our own lives. Thank you, Father. Before we do get started, uh, do you all have notes for today? How, uh, well, let me ask this. Who does not have a note instead of notes? One. Because I'm going to talk about finishing well, period, entering victoriously. Very important concept. <clears throat> also, after service, uh, uh, the Lighthouse Food Pantry has uh, all kinds of goodies in the kitchen. Uh, mostly desserts, or what is it? Mostly a dessert. If you want a humongous uh, 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 pie, stop by, okay, at the kitchen today. Seriously, take one home. Take one home. I mean, it's a pumpkin pie. They're like this big. <laughs> kind of square. Like, Jane, get one, okay? Just kidding. I like pumpkin pie. And then uh, this Friday, uh, which is New Year's Eve, I believe, right? We will be here for one hour, seven to eight, seven o'clock p.m. to eight p.m. And we're gonna we're gonna thank God for 2020. Come on, we're gonna thank the Lord. There's such this was such a negative time and kind of a dark time. Lots happened. <clears throat> that I think it's really good that we pause for a moment and just before the new year hits us to uh, thank him because the Bible says that, he's, that we are to thank him in every situation for that is the will of God, right? The situation is not the will of God necessarily, but the thanking is. And so we're not, we're not prone to thank God in the midst of, of destruction and confusion and all of that. We... We, we tend to panic, we tend to get angry, we tend to get scared. But if we stop and just praise God for a minute, that clears the heavenlies. It's amazing. Remember David coming back to his town, Ziklag? It was a Philistine town. Imagine David, he's the, the man uh, after God's heart, right? But he was so far down the road uh, that he was actually fighting Israel with the Philistines. I mean, that's, that's radical, okay, that's crazy. 
And so the, the leaders of the Philistine army said, no, 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 wait a minute. We've got Israel here, David here. He might change his mind, and we'll be caught in the middle. So send him home. And so they sent David home to a town called Ziklag that the Philistines had given David. And as they crested the hill, their town was absolutely obliterated. Everyone they loved was gone. Everything they had was stolen. Pretty rough. Israel's rejected him. Now the Philistines have rejected him. Now he comes back and his entire place is gone. What would you do? What would you do? Well, David turned his back. I think he turned his back to his men who were picking up stones to stone him. <laughs> uh, that's pretty weird. That's pretty rough, isn't it? That when, you wanna, when you look at your leader and you say, you know, it's better that we put him out of his misery. <laughs> you okay? You here? Yeah. All right, thank you. So he turned his back and he, he began to worship God and began to praise God and began to lift up and exalt and encourage himself in the Lord. There was nobody to encourage him. And so he encouraged himself in the Lord. Wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful. I want to be like that in every situation, and I'm not always that way for sure, but I certainly want to be like that. That I can separate myself from whatever happens to me, at least in the beginning, and first turn to God and begin to Praise him. Boy, our enemy, the devil, literally hates that. He can't stand that. It's, it's like him trying to shoot us, right? And, and, and the bullet blows up in his own face. It's incredibly powerful. So as, as we stand here at 2020, last Sunday in the year, what is your attitude towards this year? It's been rough. It's been crazy. We've lost family members, friends. We've lost jobs. We've, I mean, it's dismal. The outcome of the election was not exactly what some of us planned it would be. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Remember the phrase that I, I said weeks ago? If, if you're living under a Nebuchadnezzar, be a Daniel. Be a Daniel. Because the, okay, here I go again. Can you give me a minute? Because the left, the radical left, is going to kill more babies than ever before. It's going to destroy our economy. It's going to align us with Countries that we have no business aligning with. It's going to affect the church. Our freedoms will be cut. They're, they're, they're preparing society to be dependent on the government, socialism, so the next step is communism. You say, Pastor Jack, that is dismal. Wake up. For evil to triumph, good men do nothing. When good people do nothing, evil triumphs. Come on, think about that for a minute. We have the destiny of our nation in our hands. What can we do? Run for office? No. We can hit our knees this year. We can listen, be bold and say, God, separate evil people from our government. We can pray that. We can actually pray that. We can pray for God to remove evil people. There was somebody on staff, and I won't tell you which church it was, but that person was a constant hindrance and a constant, constant irritation to everything I wanted to do. So I, I, I prayed one time, and I said, Lord, would you remove that person from our church? Bam! I mean, whoa! I thought, that's, that's a lot of power, man, <laughs> that he has and, and to answer our prayers like that. But he does do that. I know it sounds ridiculous and it sounds unchristian. But we live in an unchristian world. And so we can't comply to a, to, to a world 
that is sending people down the track to death. We can't comply. We cannot comply. We may not be able to voice, but we can certainly pray for our nation. Amen? And if you, know, if, if you voted for, for uh, uh, Biden, I, I apologize. I'm not, the, man, the man needs to get saved, but there's, a, there's an agenda behind him that is bigger than he is. That's what I'm looking at, and that's what could happen, what's behind the scenes. So our country is in, anyway, so welcome to the last day of 2020, right? All that's behind us, what's in front of us. Let me tell you, the, the situations may not change. In other words, January 1st is not just this automatic reset where everything changes back to normal again. Nope. It may take a year for everything to kind of get back to what, but it'll never get back to the same normal we were used to. Because once, if, if you, how many, how many have ever done this with a rubber band? It's, it's tight, and so to stretch it, what do you do? You stretch it to the point where you think it's gonna break, right? And when you, when you release it, it doesn't spring back to the original size, it springs back to a little larger size. And that's, that's the principle here, that, that because, uh, because leadership, uh, the leadership of our country has pulled us this far, we may snap back, but it may not go back all the way. And so even though that might be a, a sad or a scary thing to say, God wants you to be so strong and so confident in him that no matter what happens, it does not affect your attitude. Come on, amen? America is still the best country. I hope in the next four years it remains the best country. But I'm a pessimist. In some cases, the glass isn't half empty. It's down, downright empty. But God is an optimist. Amen? But don't tell anyone, but in the, in the Garden of Eden, God was the pessimist. He said, if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Don't eat of this tree. That's pretty negative. But it's very positive in the sense that it, it'll save our lives. So today, let's take a look at some of these things, can we? Any other announcements? So this Friday we have prayer. After service, uh, please stop by the, the kitchen area. Is it Thursday? Oh, I'm sorry. Thursday, 7 to 8, okay. Christmas, I mean, uh, New Year's Eve. Here we go. Let me read your notes for a minute. Father, in Jesus' name, as we tackle this, Lord, guide us and direct us by your Spirit. Amen. Everyone seems to be excited about leaving 2020 behind and entering into a new year. We tend to think of January 1 as a magical reset. However, circumstances in our nation or our society may not ch change, so it's important that we are prepared. There's another issue that some do not understand. Listen to this. This is, not many people understand this principle. How we finish a season may affect the success of the next season. If you end this year completely hopeless and, you know, not knowing what to do, you're going to enter into the new year with that same attitude. Because January 1 is not a, it's not a magical threshold. It's, it's Friday. <laughs> so it's, our, it's, 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 it's how prepared are we for the future that's important. So it's how, how am I going to leave this season? And, you know, uh, each year it's, it's a pretty obvious season. Uh, by the end of the year, you know, we know we're going to enter. But how many seasons have you gone through in your life, spiritual seasons? You know, when people enter into marriage, uh, uh, that's a new season. That's why with uh, uh, marriage ceremonies, it's, it's really good to take communion because it'll, it basically, it's a Lord cleanse us from our past, <laughs> wash us, and cause us to be clean and cleansed to, to go into the new season. I'm very, very uh, 
understanding of that particular season because as I've gone through different seasons of my life, you know, when you're 70 plus, you know, you, there's a lot of seasons you've gone through, amen? You've gone through a lot of seasons. And, you know, nothing shocks you anymore, it seems like. And <clears throat> so, but I've always noticed that, that when I enter a season in a positive sense, in other words, uh, where I'm looking to Jesus, that, that season becomes what I expect it to become. Not the situations around it, but in my heart. You, you know, sin, mankind, fell in a perfect environment. So the environment is not what creates victory or anything like that. Because Adam and Eve were victorious, but they fell in a perfect environment. But Jesus, in an imperfect environment, conquered the devil in the desert. So it's not our, it's not our circumstances that dictate whether we're victorious or not. It's our heart. It's our heart. It's what's inside of me. I'm going to read the third paragraph for a minute. To be prepared for the conquest and inheriting the promised land, God commanded all of the Jewish males to be circumcised before they attacked Jericho. We're talking about Jer uh, Joshua chapter 5. And, and why did he do that? Why, why did he... They, they crossed over. Here, here's the scenario. They crossed over the river, the Jordan River, miraculously. The enemies of that promised land were panicking. But, but God says, Joshua, stop for a minute. Have all of the males circumcised. I mean, that would kind of slow you down a little. Right? That's usually done with boys eight days or so, you know. These were men. And they had to heal. And they didn't use surgical knives, they used flint stone. Yikes. <laughs> God said, I want you to stop for a minute. I don't want you to conquer Jericho with the, with the attitudes of, uh, of, of, of the last 40 years in the wilderness. Because Romans 2 says that circumcision is not of the flesh, but it's of the heart. So circumcision means to cut around. It means to cut off the things of the flesh of my own heart. We don't do circumcision uh, today for, for those reasons, where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in obedience to God's word. Uh, but we circumcise our own hearts we take care, we deal with the things... Job is a little bit too loud, or there's an echo here. It, we deal with the things that, that uh, we have to deal with. So circumcision is not of the flesh, it's of the heart. To be circumcised in your heart means that you are cleansed. Amen? And have a good standing, a free standing, a clean standing before God. You're circumcised. You're dealing with the stuff that's in your heart. Did you know that when you murmur, did you know that when you have an offense at somebody, did you know that, that when you, when you self-talk, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Do you know that God is listening? I mean, we don't think about that. Right? We just kind of think that we're justified in hating that person or not liking that person. But God is, God is listening. God is listening to me. He listens to my heart. He listens to my mouth. And you know, I wish I could tell you, don't talk to Jane, but I wish I could tell you that, that I was a lot further, on, <laughs> further down the line than, than I think a lot of people think. I, I have... I have raw emotions sometimes. I have anger, right? You know, I get mad at people. You're looking at me like, really? <laughs> <laughs> of course, my anger is always justified because they did me wrong. So God will say, it's okay to be angry because he did do you wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, God's not on my side when I'm offended. I don't care what the circumstances are. 
He's not on my side when I'm offended. And so to be circumcised is to deal with that in my own heart. How do you deal? How do you deal with an offense? Isn't it hard? Because we think we're okay until we see the person again. It's like, oh. You know? And so I ask the Lord, Father, let me so forgive that person that when I see them, I don't feel that way. Well, he said, well, Jack, uh, your friend Jack Hafer wrote a book. Oh, yeah, what book? The Key to Everything. How would you like to read a book called The Key to Everything? Wouldn't that be cool? All I have to do is read that one book. And I didn't like that book. Because the key to everything has the word give in it. Forgive and give. Two things that I have problems with. It's easy to forgive certain things and certain people. Let me go up here for a minute. My expectation for some people, and especially people who don't know Jesus, is down here. Right? So when they offend me, it's, it's okay. I mean, you know, come on. They're... But there are people who are here. Like, okay. They offend me. You know, I get a little twisted. Bring it to God and say, okay, Lord, they're just doing that because they don't know better. But there are people who are here. Eye, po- eye to eye. They're my peer. They're my family. They're people. And when they do something wrong... I have a hard time forgiving because they know better. And I, I, I self-talk all this stuff, you know. And God says, Jack, relax. Release them. When, if you can release people who are here, and I don't mean that's less. You know what I'm talking about, right? Does it make sense? If you can release people that are here, you can release people that are here. Yeah, but Lord, uh, uh, Jane knows better, you know. Uh, Joe knows me. He did that on purpose, you know. There was an individual who came into my office and he's been a friend for 22 years. And he was carrying an offense against me for the last two or three years. Ministry. Two or three years. And so I was so excited when he said, hey, can we, can we connect? Absolutely, man. I've been thinking about you too. So, you know, my expectation, we're going to have a glorious time of fellowship. Right? About 75, 80% into the, into the visit, all of a sudden everything changes. Like, wow, what's going on here? Jack, I, w- I want you to know that I've been very, very offended with you because I, you did this, and he, he names what he thinks I did. I said, wow, that's pretty bad. <laughs> Do you, I said, stop, stop. Do you think for a minute that I would do that? Would, would, do you think that I would do that? Well, no. Then why in the world are you believing it? Why do you believe that I would do that if you know I wouldn't do that? That makes no sense. I said, you are faced with one thing, man. You've got to forgive me. Whether I did it or not, I, I don't... I don't think I did that. I don't think I did that anywhere. I didn't do that. (laughs) Have have you ever been in that kind of a situation? You know, I've shared this before, but somebody in our church in Flagstaff said, she was all excited coming to me after a service. You know, she said, oh, Pastor Jack, I love you. I said, yeah, I love you too, man. We're friends, right? What's going on? God has finally delivered me from an offense against you for the last four years. You've been, a, you've, you've been offended with me for the last four years? Yeah. Holy moly. You know what? What? You need to pray for me, because now I'm offended with you. <laughs> right? True story, right, Jay? I said, I can't believe it. I said, I'm, I'm praise God that you've been set free, but now you've got to pray for me that I be set free. And, you know, it wasn't that hard. Come on, it wasn't that hard, because her heart was right, you know. She was excited. She was carrying this this thing. I don't even know what she was uh, offended by. 
I have no clue. How many know that, that you don't always know what you do behind the scenes? Like you're walking through life and, and uh, you know, your waves back here, you know, <laughs> like in a boat, you know, your waves, they splash people in the face and you don't even know it. Like, hallelujah. Hey, hi. You know, they're all wet. Why are you wet? Because of you. You know, it's, it's crazy. And so life is complicated. Life is messy. Life is dirty. Life is crazy. And we can't go through life with mud, with water, with things on us. We've got to take a spiritual bath every time something happens to us. Every time. Every time. We, we let nothing stick to us. We circumcise our hearts immediately. We come to God immediately. We don't let anything, because when stuff sticks to you, when we were, when we were stuck in the mud over going to Chaco Canyon, our team, uh, we were using Brian and Heidi's uh, uh, over-the-top, four-wheel drive, bells and whistles uh, boat. Right? It should have done all that, right, Brian? But it didn't. Why? Because the, the tires, we were so unbelievably stuck. And it's still a miracle, isn't it, how, how God got us out of that? Isn't it? It's just like I'm still chewing on it. But mud was stuck to the tires. I mean, it, was not, it, was, it wasn't mud. It was slime mud. It was clay. And it stuck. And it, the tires kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until they, they couldn't get bigger anymore because they filled up the entire wheel well, you know, complete. And so that's the way people are sometimes. They, they, they're going through this mud, and that mud sticks to them, and they have no traction, and they, 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 they just are stuck in life because of this stuff on them. Am I making sense? I mean, this is not in my notes, okay? This is a... So I'm going to be, I'm going to walk through life to the best of my ability. Uh, how we got out was uh, we were praying for a, for a shovel, and uh, here comes this mad Navajo guy just in, in this little car slipping and sliding all over the place, and he gets out, get out of my way, can't move. I can't. Move over there. I can't. We can't. We're stuck. Move it. What do you not understand? We're stuck. Do you have a shovel? Yeah. Really? Open the trunk. It's the only tool he had. We needed a shovel. And what we did was we would chip off the mud. And then, uh, you know, a few cycles of the tires later, we'd stop again and take everything off. And we, God brought us out. In a miraculous way. Triple A was looking for me in Arizona. We were in New Mexico. So God, when you lean on the arm of flesh, that's the way it is. <laughs> They're looking for you in Arizona when you're in New Mexico. So <clears throat> here we are, 2020. 2020 hindsight is going to be what we're going to experience here in a minute, right? It's 2020, but now hindsight is better. How, do you remember... Do you remember uh, when 2020 began, how there were a lot of preachers that were just, you know, it's going to be the, the year of understanding and the year of vision, et cetera, et cetera. Do you remember that? And Kawami, man, we just got hit. Like, bang. We have to make sure that we don't believe every prophetic word. Come on. Not every prophetic word, even, there, even if they're on TV. Is Jesus speaking, okay? You gotta have your discernment on. You know, there's a little story in the Bible. The king had surrounded him with all of these prophets, and they were all prophesying victory. King, you're gonna be victorious. And you know, the king was all excited, but then after a while he said, You know what? I need to have somebody who will give me a different scenario. Oh, there, there there's this prophet over here. Bring him in. And so he's he, comes in and he hears all of them prophesying victory. And so he goes, well, hey, king, you're going to be victorious. And the king goes, you know what? You have never said that about me. Tell me the truth. Don't just prophesy what everybody else is prophesying. Prophesy the truth. He said, all right, you're going to die today. So he put him in prison. The prophet. The prophet ends up in prison. And that day, the, the king was shot with an arrow and died. The thing is, that is, sometimes there's a lot of prophets going around and feeling that, you know, that things are going to get better. But 
the thing is, folks, listen, the thing with us, and especially Pentecostals, is we can't stand brokenness. We can't stand things we can't fix. Come on. And so we prophesy. I want to tell you, I, I, I do not know what this year holds. I have no clue. What I shared with you earlier is not a prophecy, it's my own opinion. But I'm not sure it's going to be as nice as we think it is. I think where the church needs to wake up. I mean, I think the church needs to stop playing games. We need to stop being afraid. We need to stop being territorial. We, we, need, we need to get Jesus in our hearts. Churches do. We're, the churches have become, listen, churches have, have, have become clubs. Have become, you know, praise and worship has become, has become a concert. I mean, it's just so much insanity in the church world today that that kind of a church will not endure the coming seasons we must be stronger. We can't play games. We can't go to Sunday and think that our church is better than that church or whatever. Boy, you're just a small... You still going to that church? Oh, my gosh. We're the body of Christ. And when you're a body, you don't kick yourself. You don't stomp on your own feet. You don't bite your fingers. Amen? We do need to get... A, we need to wake up as a church in America... It's not the Pentecostals against the traditional. It's not the Catholic against the, the Lutherans. It, it, it's what, what ridiculous, what craziness that is. There is not a Pentecostal room in heaven. There's not a house that says, we, you know, we're, we're the first Baptist church of heaven. We are one body. <laughs> I'm looking for the Pentecostals in heaven, right? And some of them aren't there. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh, the church. It's still God's apple of his eye, okay? We are still the apple of his eye, as, as crazy as, as we are, as foolish as we are. And so in Joshua chapter 5, Verse 1 through 9, we see that, that Israel became, Israel was circumcised. And they were incapacitated for how long? A couple of weeks. There's Jericho looming. And here they are, unable to defend themselves. God was serious. You're not going to carry the mindset that you developed in the, in the, in the wilderness into the new season. You're going to be circumcised. You can't carry this woe is me into the new church, into the new season. So they had a lot of time to think about that. And then they went. Joshua meets the, meets actually the Lord. It's a Christophany. Meets the Lord. The Lord says, take off your, feet, your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And this is, this is what Joshua said. He saw Jesus not knowing it was God. And he had a, what he saw was a man standing with a sword drawn. And what Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries? God isn't for you. You're, you're in him. Does that make sense? Well, God's not for me? No, because if he's for me, he's against someone else. And the disciples couldn't, couldn't, couldn't reconcile this. They said, they said, man, these people are doing stuff that you haven't, haven't okayed. And Jesus said some, something very powerful. He said, if they're not for me, they're, or, or if, if they're not against me, they're for me. And that kind of talk just makes no sense to us. So God isn't necessarily on my side. Joshua, I'm not on your side or their side. You need to be on my side. You need to be on my side, Joshua. You need to do, you need to capture my thoughts. You need to capture my, my purposes. You need to capture my heart. You need to understand who I am so that you can be on my team. And the church needs to understand God's ways. 
The church needs to understand God's purposes, and we need to be on God's side. Not God on our side. We need to be on God's side. That's a, an important concept that is difficult for churches to understand. So as we go into this new year, there's four characteristics that I, that I kind of uh, toyed with today, and, and they're found in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 2. You can either read it from your notes or from your Bible, but let me read it from here. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and they're referring to Hebrews 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with, with endurance, with patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here, here are four things that I think are important. Number one, therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, model, the, the, these are four important principles to take into the new, 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 uh, new year. Model uh, yourself after righteous role models. Model your life after or learn from those who have been and who are successfully successful godly role models. You know, I saw this one individual who was just idolizing this particular well-known person. Just idolizing. Just, oh, oh, if I could only meet him, my life would be all right. And, you know, I, I wanted to say, you know what? This guy is in immorality. He's in anger. He loves himself more than he loves anyone else. He's boastful. Yeah, but everybody likes him. That's because they're stupid, but you don't have to be. Well, what do you mean? He's... Look at him, he's so well-known, he's, he's a great man. He's like, no, he's not, he's a mess. And so we roll, or we, we model ourselves after role models that behind the scenes are messed up. And then when they fall, it's like, oh my gosh, how can that person, I, I couldn't believe it. Of course he's going to fall. Now, I'm not talking about sports people only, I'm talking about ministry idols, uh, all kinds of people, and especially ministry idols. I had a dream last night, and, and uh, uh, a pastor of a large church was walking, and, and, and he was, I saw him from behind, and behind, you know, walking with him was this massive demon of pride. Now, don't ask me why I had that dream. I have dreams, and I, they're not always God. But it was, it was quite the picture. Because even in ministry, even in the church world, we can, be, we can idolize the wrong things. You know, we idolize this pastor because of this big church, mega church, or this thing that he has and whatever, and we idolize. We, we're not to do that. We're not to compare ourselves with. We are to, to, to take people who, who love God, who are, who are humble, who, who, who understand the fact that they are nothing without him. Model yourself after that. Really. So Hebrews 11, we see all of these people that, that have done great things. Well, why do you think they do great things? Because they were, they were strong in their own selves? No, 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 no. Because they trusted in God. They had faith. It's the, it's the, it's the chapter on faith. So these people conquered, not because of, of their own strength, but because they had faith in God. There's not a whole lot of people that I model myself after outside of the Bible, I mean, because, first of all, we're all human beings, and, and uh, I remember the first time that, that my, a man I, I very, very strongly uh, loved and respected, and the guy went south on me. It's like, what happened? So, Jack, if, if, you, if you idolize somebody, you raise them up to a level that they're not capable of, of maintaining. 
And therefore, I will show you their humanity by letting you see their, their mistakes. Are you, are you here? Very important. And so I'm not going to model myself after a particular person necessarily. I mean, I do, uh, you know, there, there's a whole list of people that I admire. But if they fell away from the Lord, it would not affect my, person, my, my personal relationship with Christ. Why? Because, you know why. Number two. Well, so number one, letter A, model your life. Letter B, who are the biblical and contemporary heroes who inspire me? You know, I, you can use this and actually write in this thing, okay? I left some blanks for you, but you can use the other side. Uh, but who, who are the people that, this is a, 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 you know, this is a, you have to sit down and, and consciously and, and uh, intentionally do this, to think about all these things. But, you know, who are the people that inspire you? Do they love God more than you do? Yeah. You know, are they in love with the Lord? Or, or do you admire them just because they can do something? Do you admire them for their integrity? Or do you admire them for their ability? Number two, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Choose to lay aside the things that encumber or hinder you from living for Christ. You know, year after year after year after year, there are people who never seem to grow beyond their level in, in Christ. They just never seem to grow. Someone came to me once, and you know, I had mentored this, this individual, and he said, boy, Pastor Jack, you've really grown in the spirit. Well, I got offended at first. It's like, you haven't. <laughs> and the Lord said, hey, 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 relax. And all of a sudden I realized, he actually, I have. I've grown in the spirit. Praise God. I don't know that I grow. You know, I see my grandkids, right? And, and you know, I look down on them. And then a couple of years later, they're here. And, and now they're like, here. You know, because I don't see the growth. You should hear Jeremiah. I, lo I love him. He's our oldest grandkid. He used to have a child's voice. But now when he talks, when, when his siblings talk, he's like a man talking. It's like that really, like, whoa, your voice, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean, you know. It's like, wow, is it? You got a man in the house now, yeah. But so we don't see our own personal growth, but we do grow, hopefully. But, we, but, it, but growth is not, growth is not what? Automatic. It is in physical senses to some degree, but spiritually, no. Spiritual growth is not automatic. Spiritual growth, you grow to the degree that you spend time with the grower. The one that makes you grow, right? So you spend time. So uh, um, uh, what are the things, what are the things that, that in my life, if I stopped doing that, that I could serve God better? I mean, just think for a minute. I know it's the, it's the after turkey lull, but you know, hang in there. Now, how many, how many barbecued your turkey? Anybody in the room? I mean, not barbecued. What is it? Uh, deep fried. How, anybody have a deep fried turkey? You did, John. Was it good? Oh, I bet the, I bet the skin is crunchy. I love crunchy skin. It's like I peel it off and pretend no one did that. You know, when you're carving the turkey, where's that big patch of skin? Well, I don't know. It's down in the grease somewhere. <laughs> so what is it in me? What, what attitudes, what things that if, I mean, honestly, what, what kind of, uh, I'll, since I'm up here, I'll, I obviously have to be transparent, right? But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I just wish I could, I just wish I could feel confident a lot more than I do. Come on. I feel confident with people who are, who, who are not to the degree or not to the same level or whatever you want to call it. I feel comfortable. But all of a sudden, when, I, when, I, when I'm with people who really have attained or achieved or are something that I've wanted, all of a sudden I feel not confident anymore. So I had to deal with that. It's not the big issue anymore. Here's something else that'll, that'll cause me not to follow Christ with, with, a, with in, in 
intensity is that I, I, you know, if I'm sick or something like that, you know, I want people to know I'm sick. Come on, does anybody else know what I'm talking about? You know, you want, you want to know, hey, Jack, how are you doing? Oh, uh, pray for me. <laughs> okay. You know, I, when I had that tendonitis thing, or I don't know what that was, every joint hurt, hurt for about two months. Oh, it was like, hey, Pastor Jack, how, how are you doing? I wanted to say, oh, my God, I'm just like, I'm a mess. And God said, no, 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 st- speak victoriously. I said, doing great. You know, got some things going on, but hey, God is good. God is good. But empathy. I just, I just want people's, <laughs> you know, I understand what you're going through. Yeah, you do, you really, whoa, you know, woe is me. And God said, you can serve me better if you get rid of that attitude right there. Because, because things are going to go wrong with you, and you can't, you don't have the option of letting other people think that you're suffering. Like, well, that's not fair. Not fair or whatever, but you've, you signed up, that, Jack. You signed up for this. And so when things are, are not going well for you, don't tell everybody. Don't, don't just open up. And, so I, I did. I started working on that area in my life. I still think that. It's like, hmm. So and so didn't call me, and they know I'm sick. Right? God says, circumcise that. Cut it. You can't go into the new year with that attitude. You are confident. You are victorious. You are who I say you are. And you know what, Jack? Other people have, have gone through that with much worse things. You are not the one with the worst condition. So stop focusing on yourself. If I'm self-conscious, I'm not God-conscious. So don't, don't be self-conscious. Don't be conscious of self, but rather be God-conscious. So Jack, lay aside. So, you know, there are things like when you're a pastor or a leader or a public leader, you know, uh, uh, you don't see a lot of things. And I, I really have a heart for pastors and people who, who have a ministry, uh, a public ministry, where the people uh, look at them and they, they think that and what happens is if they can't deal with a particular sin in their life, then they submerge it. They, they move it down so that you don't see it. They don't deal with it, but you don't see it. But that is dangerous because if whatever you, mo- you press down will ultimately erupt like a volcano. And so you have to deal as a pastor or a leader or, or, or a father or a mother, or a grandparent, etc. You have to deal with your own things. So that you really are who you appear to be. So that I really am who I appear to be. I need to be who I say I am. Say, well, okay. No, no, no. Listen to it. I need to be who I say I am. Who who, who do people think you are? Is that who you really are? You know, I get the the privilege of being transparent to you. And people who don't like to be transparent stay in this church for one Sunday. Because when the pastor is transparent, it means that they have to be transparent too, or something happens and, and they, they, they're afraid because transparency means that everything, oh, I can't. But you don't have to do what I do. You don't have to stand up here and go, I'm a jerk. Well, we all know that, but you, know, you don't have to say that. Kidding, 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 kidding. <laughs> But if I don't, I can only lead this church to the capacity or, or the, 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 as far as I am. And too many leaders have this, this big gap between who they say they are, or, or et cetera, or who they preach and where they are. And so one of the things, and I'm just telling you, this is the weight that I have to let go. You know, I'm still working on it. I have to be who I say I am. So therefore, I'm going to tell you right away, I'm a jerk. I just did it. I just crossed the bridge. <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not an angel. I, 
I'm not. I'm, I'm self-centered sometimes, but I'm definitely, uh, uh, I'm not comfortable with people all the time. Jack, come over, we're having a party. No, I'm, I'm okay, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah? Jack, are you all by yourself? Loving it. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you know, one time, my Pastor John Castile that I was under for so many years in the beginning in Tucson, he, he wanted me to, to do something, and I didn't want to, he knew I didn't want to do it. But I ended up doing it, and he said, it's amazing what you'll do when your salary depends on it. And I thought, you know what, that really spoke to me. I said, you mean I'm serving Jesus because of a salary? Whoa, that's not right, Lord. Okay, that's not right. So I dealt with that. Amen? I dealt with that. Real quick. Number three. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Determine in your heart that you won't give up. Ever. Everybody say, ever. ever. I will not give up. Say that, I will not give up. Now, God knows that you can't do it apart from him. And so, God, I, I'm not going to give up. We've had some, some serious issues in our own personal lives, you know, that, that many people would have given up. But I'm not going to give up. You know, uh, there was a season in this church that wasn't always so positive. And uh, it was an attack on Jane and I. I mean, an attack. And I couldn't tell the church what was happening. I didn't even tell Jane what was happening. And some of you know what I'm talking about. It was an attack. Their desire was to get Lankhorst out of here by sundown because he's messing up the works. <laughs> you know, the, the Roman army had, a, had, had their armor on, right? <clears throat> and their feet, they had shoes of peace. Now, I'm not sure exactly how that translates into, into what the shoes were, but the shoes had spikes They had spikes. Why? Because when they did this, you couldn't move them. They couldn't slide away. They were stuck. And it, and it, and it gave them traction and the ability to uh, lean into it. And so in this particular season of my life, I needed shoes that were like spikes, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and I did. I, I, huh? We lived through that season. That wasn't the first time. We had that season in Flagstaff and we had that season in, in Tucson. Seasons where life began to fight you, where it seemed like everything was against you. Everything In Tucson, they, the pastors actually wrote a letter to me, all the pastors signed. I was, an, I was an assistant pastor, but they all wrote a letter. They wrote a letter and signed it all that I had till sundown to get out of Dodge. Remember that? And I said, okay, my, I'm done. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. And the Lord said, stick. Stay. Don't give up. But they told me to get out of here. I didn't tell you to get out of here. Stand firm. <laughs> so what, what he, the picture he gave me was that I was handcuffed to a pole, to a, to a concrete pillar, and my feet were flapping in the wind. <laughs> you know, Stand firm. The same thing happened in Flagstaff. Stand firm, Jack. Don't leave. And four years into the ministry in this church, stand firm, don't leave. I wanted to leave. Because I said, too old to deal with that stuff. The Lord said, stand firm. We don't have an option to quit. There is no plan B, as some of the men have said. There is no plan B. There's only God's plan, and we can't quit on that. Can you imagine? Here, I've, next year, I will have known the Lord 50 years. And, and what if one day I said, okay, that's enough. What a ridiculous mistake that would be. 
What kind of a legacy would I leave? Uh, so I'm not staying at and not giving up because I don't want... No, no, no. I'm not giving up because he didn't give up on me. And so I'm not going to give up. That's one of the things that this particular... It says, run the race with endurance. With passion and with... with I can't go to church today because I got a headache. Well, go and, the, and God will take the headache away. God, change your thinking. <laughs> Pastor Jack, it's my one year old birthday. Oh, when's the party? It's at five. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Stand firm. Give yourself the, the passion that it requires to be who God has called you to be. You are, you, are, you are servants of the Most High, but you are in the army. And so we need to act like an army. We need to have our conviction like an army. I couldn't go AWOL in boot camp. Well, I, well, I probably could, but there's no way to sneak out. So I, I, I didn't like the military, so they deal, dealt with me, but I didn't quit. <laughs> Okay, so determine in your heart, why? Listen, I know I've got to close. Why do I always give up on things? Why, why do I give up? And then last, real quick, looking unto Jesus. You know, um, letter B, number four, letter B, where I think it's important that this year, if you don't do anything else, I mean, don't, don't make these long, extravagant uh, uh, things. You know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this and that. And you know that January 3, it's, you're back into it again. So it's not... <laughs> it doesn't work. But this thing, do. Do this, this one thing, and everything else will fall in place. Find your prayer closet and guard it with your life. Find your prayer closet. Jesus said in Matthew that if you pray in your closet, he will reward you openly. And when people don't have the power to serve God, they have no prayer closet. <clears throat> you need to have a prayer closet. You need to have a place where you meet with God. Right? Do you have a prayer place, Mary? Man, I wish I lived where you lived. You got a whole five acres of a prayer closet. <clears throat> In Flagstaff, one of my prayer closets was this pine tree that had roots into the rock, and I was sitting on the cliff, about a 300-foot down cliff, with my legs over the end because there was a branch right here I could hold. That was my prayer closet. I, I actually saw eagles circling under my feet and going up like that. It was the greatest prayer closet in the world. I miss that place. But I have one here. I have a prayer closet. I have prayer closets here. I have places where I meet with God, regularly. Not every day, whatever, you know, but just regularly. So where is a place that you could meet with God? Men have man caves, why don't we have a God cave? Forget the man cave. That's kind of dumb. Have a God cave. A God room. Jane has a room in her house. She closes the door and I have to knock. Because that's her prayer, prayer room. Of course, she has the other room for her clothes. And I, I have this little area at the, at the table that's my, my area. <laughs> but she has a prayer room. Isn't that great? Let's stand for a minute. Let, let me pray with you. <clears throat> How many are kind of glad you came? <laughs> okay. I'm telling you, I've got a word for next, next Sunday already. So how are you leaving the, the season of the 2020, the, 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 the pandemic? How are you leaving that? Scared? Are you bringing fear into the into the twenty into twenty twenty one? You know, are you bringing that in? Uh, 
I, I, Jane and I are not afraid, but we obviously are very careful. We wear our mask, we wash our hands, la la la. You know, in fact, my fingers are starting to split because I've been washing my hands so much. But I'm going to continue to do that. And I'm, I'm becoming a real germaphobe. <laughs> oh, I wish I wasn't. My car was broken into a couple nights ago. And I went to my car and it was a mess. The seats were everywhere. And this trash was all over inside my car. I was like, what happened? Well, I, I was take some taking some stuff out of the car and I, and I was gonna come back and unlock it but I didn't it teach me to lock it, keep it open. But unbelievable. And so I sat in there and I goes, oh where have these hands been? So I just started wiping everything down, man. Everything down. Is that crazy? No, that's just me. But I'm not afraid. There's a difference. I'm not afraid to step out of my house. I'm not afraid to mingle with you, with, with people. When I know they're not sick, it's okay. If they're sick, I'm not going to be with you. Right? Wisdom. You know, we're closing this, this year with so many mixed emotions. I want, you to, uh, I want you to use our, we, we have our ushers back there for the offering, or you can use the uh, uh, the app, the Tithely app, to, to give to Christian Life Center. This is the last Sunday, obviously, you know, for tax purposes, it helps. But, but I want you to give to God. Man, I want you to give to God. I don't know how much you're supposed to give. I have no clue. But it's easy for me to give $5. But it's not easy for me to give a little bit more. So it's, it's okay. So my threshold is somewhere between $5 and $100 where it's comfortable. But, but it's easy to be comfortable. I, I got to now step over one step. And that's how I grow. Come on, that's how I grow. I step over one step into the uncomfortable zone. Not, not, not too far in there. Just one step. And that's how I grow. That's what I do financially, Jane and I. That's what I do emotionally. That's what I do with relationships. Every area of my life, I, I take, I find out where my comfort zone ends, and then I take one more little step. Now, I'm talking for next week's lesson, okay, or our sermon. But I, I, I take one more just because then uh, I grow. Father, I pray for the church. I pray that as we close this year, Father, we pray that, it would be, that we would finish 2020 well. Oh, we're all excited to have a new year, but Lord, oh, really? It's not, nothing's going to change too quickly. So Lord, it's not about entering into the, the new year. It's entering into a new revived relationship with you. So Lord, the notes, let them be a helpful tool to everyone. We give you our hearts in this last Sunday of the year. Lord, we give you our hearts. I want you to thank the Lord for this last year. Go ahead. Say, I don't know if I can eat that. I'll just say it anyway. Lord, I thank you for 2020. Thank you for this year. It certainly was challenging, Father, in so many ways. Lord, the Bible says that you crown the year with your goodness. So that hasn't changed. You've still crowned the year with your goodness. Those who have lost loved ones, God, only you can bring comfort. Those who have, have had their lives changed in a dramatic way, Father, I pray that you would, you would come to their rescue, Father.
give you the praise in Jesus' name. If you don't know the Lord, if you don't know Jesus, it's a good, good opportunity to start 2021 in a relationship with God. You say, well, how can I do that? It's very simple. You just simply talk to someone you can't see. <laughs> he's invisible, but he's there. You don't see the wind, but you see the branches of God is, is here, and if you talk to him and say, Lord, come into my life, be my Savior, be my Lord, fill me with your Spirit, he's going to answer that prayer. But you need to do it on your own. In fact, the Lord is saying, pray that right now. Father, if you're wanting to, to create a relationship with God, say this, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Cleanse me of all my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Make me a follower and a disciple. In your precious name.